Ladies, welcome, welcome. It is so good to see you all. I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and I'm very thankful that each one of you all are here today. My name is Sherelle Warren. I'm your teaching leader for this class. We have a few announcements, or maybe one announcement, and it is uh, just a reminder about our Christmas break. Okay, ladies, we do have two more classes coming. Um, outside of this class, and so Christmas break, our last class of 2022 will be Tuesday, December the 13th, okay? And then we will return on Tuesday, January the 10th of 2023. And so your uh, group leaders will also send that information out to you, but I just wanted to give you just a quick reminder. All righty. So, Today we will have an outline that will appear for the lecture, but this lecture is a provided lecture from headquarters. And so don't worry if you're not able to capture uh, the information there because it will also be on the MyBSF website along with this uh, lecture and it will also be on my YouTube channel. Okay, ladies? And so... Today, our special headquarters speaker is Dr. David Talley, and he has served at, uh, Bi I think it's pronounced Biola University since 1998. He teaches the Old Testament, and he's also occupied several administrative um, roles there, okay? He serves at Cornerstone Church, of Long Beach since 2020 as pastor of teaching and theology. He is passionate about teaching God's word, discipleship, and passing on the faith to the next generation. And we should all have that passion to pass on the faith to the next generation. He's also authored uh, and co-authored several books. One of the things that I wanted to share with you about Dr. Talley um, was that when I went to the launch this year in Arlington, Texas, uh, he spoke there, and I was asking the Lord to give me something um, very personal about him, and I couldn't remember what happened outside of him speaking, but this morning I saw Dr. Talley on his knees, before he spoke, and a posture of worship. And I said, oh, Lord, you are so faithful and so good that you would help me remember this mighty man of God, that that was his posture before speaking. And even though I knew that God had given that to me, I had to call someone up who was also there just to verify. Did I see that with my eyes? Is that what... Dr. Talley did? And she said, absolutely. That was exactly what he did. So how faithful that God would show me that, not when I asked, but when he knew I needed it most, and that it would be so imparted upon me that we all should be in a place of worship and whatever service God calls us to, whether it's on this stage whether it is in the grocery store, whatever God has called you to, however he wants to use you to take forth his message to his people and to others who don't know him, stay in a posture of worship and praise to the only true and living God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so I will pray for us, and once you watch this lecture, you will be free to go. I will not come back on the stage, but I want to pray us in and pray us out at the same time. So would everyone bow their heads. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful 
for who you are, Lord. We are just uh, in awe of your awesomeness, Lord, that there is no other God like you, Lord. You are the only true and living God, Lord. I am so grateful for how you reveal yourself um, as we study these passages and as I've spoken several times this morning. You reveal yourself in creation. You reveal yourself through your word, through the scriptures, through your people, through believers, Heavenly Father, through the Holy Spirit. And we are just so grateful that you desire to use us, even though we are not always faithful, but you are faithful to us. We know that we are rebellious people, Lord, but you see fit to use us anyway. We are flawed, we are broken, but Lord, you are not. You are perfect. And so may we keep our eyes so focused on you because you are where our help comes from. I thank you that your mercies are new every morning, and we give you praise and honor in the only name that I know, Jesus. In Jesus' mm, name we pray, amen. As we open our Bibles to prophetic literature, you might feel a little bit intimidated. In many ways, I still am. Many of you may have probably not spent much time reading through these books. And if and when you read parts of it, there's a high probability that it felt a little gloom and doom, maybe even a downer. And because much of this literature is a little more poetic, you may have understood only a fraction of what you read. I begin with these words to put us all at ease. These are some tough books to march through. However, they also contain some incredible promises about Jesus and God's plan for redemption. When we think of Old Testament prophecy, we usually think of prophetic books in the Bible, but we must keep in mind that there were three kinds of prophets. Prophets whose messages are not recorded in the Bible, prophets whose messages are preserved in a book of the Bible, and false prophets whose messages were self-seeking and not of the Lord. All three kinds of prophets are found in the Bible, but we might be more familiar with some than others. Although we have references to prophets very early in the Old Testament, like Moses, for instance, prophets did not have a significant voice in the nation until the time period of the kings. It was Samuel whom God used to establish a more central role for the prophetic voice. So the books of Samuel and Kings are the primary sources of information about the biblical prophets. Why is this? Well, the kings were charged with leading the nation under the rule and reign of the Lord. But what happened when the king began to lose his way and lead the people away from the Lord into paganism? When that happened, the king needed a corrective voice. So God used various prophets to be his voice and to bring a message of correction from the Lord and usually to the king. Who were these prophets and what do we know about them? According to 1 Kings 14, one through four, we know that they maintained private lives. They did not get struck by a blinding light and walk around with a lingering glow. They did not sit on top of a mountain somewhere stroking their long white beard thoughtfully and wait for the Lord to give them a message. They had jobs. They struggled through the issues of life. Some were even married and had children. Their children possibly talked back to them. And perhaps they raised their voices at their children from time to time. Every day they woke up to their list of chores and responsibilities. They worked hard. Yes, they were people like you and me, only they had a unique role in the work that God is doing in this world. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1-7, through 7, we see that they had understudies, the sons of the prophets, who maintained some type of communal existence. We do not know much about the purposes of these understudies or the communities in which they lived. Were they in vocational training school, majoring in prophecy? That seems odd, but maybe. Did they choose to be in such a commune, meaning that it was desirable? Or did they have to be chosen to be in the commune, meaning that it was a privilege? What was its purpose? 
Were prophets in that high of a demand that it required constant training? We do not really know the answer to these questions. For the most part, in the biblical account, prophets simply appear. We also find in passages like 2 Kings 5, 1 through 16, that they received income for their services. There is not a lot that is said about this, but we know it happened. So being a prophet could be a legitimate vocation, providing resources for a family. However, it must be clarified that true prophets could never be manipulated by gifts of money. They were not marketing their services with the hopes of gaining wealth. No, they were spokespersons for the Lord. He called them into service when needed, and He was their provider. Their number one priority was to be faithful to Him. In fact, at times they refused any kind of gift, as in the case of Elisha, who refused a gift from Naaman, whom he healed of leprosy. We are not certain why Elisha denied this legitimate gift, but he did. Even though we have very little information about the lives of prophets, we do see evidence that they often had what we would call ecstatic experiences like dreams and visions when the Lord would give them a message to proclaim. The book of Zechariah is full of visions, or better yet, difficult visions. We also have examples where they might request music to be played so they might hear a word from the Lord. Was that to set a certain mood, to relax them, or to give them inspiration? Again, we do not know. They just ask for it. For the most part, we have no idea how they receive their message. They just receive it. And that's okay because all of these details of the prophetic experience and all of the questions we might have are secondary. Of primary importance is the message they brought to a people who desperately needed to hear from the Lord. So that is the Bible's focus, and that is to be our focus. The first type of prophets mentioned above is those whose words have not been preserved in books that bear their names. Everything we know about these prophets' lives and messages is recorded in the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. Oddly, some of the most famous prophets do not have prophecies recorded in a book bearing their name. For instance, consider the following, Abraham, Moses, Samuel, Nathan, Elijah, or Elisha. These prophets were used in significant ways by the Lord, bringing messages of much importance, but none of their sermons were ever recorded in a book. Think about it for a moment. Wouldn't you like a book of Elijah's prophecies? Or Elisha? We probably know more about the events of their lives than the prophets whose messages are recorded in the Bible, but we know less about their prophetic messages. The second type of prophets is those who have their messages recorded in books bearing their names. They are usually divided into two categories, major and minor prophets. The first category, the major prophets, include the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The use of the word major is not a reference to the size of the books. Daniel is no longer than the minor prophet book of Hosea and Lamentations is about the same size as most minor prophet books. To understand the reason, we have to turn our attention to the minor prophets. The second category, the minor prophets, includes the books of Hosea through Malachi. In the Hebrew Bible, the minor prophets form one book referred to as the Twelve. According to the Talmud, they were combined into one scroll for fear that if they remained in separate scrolls, they might be lost. The arrangement of these 12 books is most likely associated with a general understanding of the respective date of writing. The fact that these 12 books were combined on one scroll is probably the major reason that they were called the minor prophets, and the remainder of the prophets were called the major prophets. However, for our purposes, we need to only think in terms of the prophetic books, large or small. They play a significant role in the work that God is doing through His people. The third type of prophets is the false prophet, a prophet who did not speak on behalf of the Lord. This prophet was not called by God, but rather assumed the role of being a prophet in a deceptive and self-seeking manner. 
Examples of false prophets would be Zedekiah and the 400 prophets in Israel, whose account is found in 1 Kings chapter 22, and Hananiah, who's mentioned in Jeremiah 28. These prophets usually gave messages that were pleasing to the king or what the people wanted to hear. In 1 Kings 22, we also see that they conspired together to have the same message so that all of their messages would appear to be legitimate. Their attitude was, this is definitely the word of the Lord. We all have the same message. This gave the king confidence. He felt good. The prophets felt good. The people felt good. But it was not good. And the events that followed never turned out good. Imagine the difficulty of living in this time and determining whether a prophet was true or false. Whenever a message was given, there was a lot riding on the line. Should the people listen and obey or not? Well, actually, it does not take a great deal of imagination because we also live in a time period where those who stand before God's people are giving a message claiming that it is a message from the Lord and not all of them are true messengers. We have to be discerning. So what do we do? We do what Israel did, or at least what they were supposed to do. With our Bibles open, we listen. We listen to hear if the messages they are proclaiming are consistent with what the Lord has given us in his already revealed word. God's word is the standard of measure. We take every word we hear from the prophets or preachers in our days and we search God's word to see if the message we are hearing is consistent with the message that God has already given us. This is what Israel was supposed to do. It's amazing how simple God keeps things. We just need to listen. So do you think that you would have wanted to be a prophet in Israel? Does it sound like a special and important calling? Well, it was, but it was also a high calling with weighty responsibilities. The calling of a prophet was often to a life that included elements of difficulty. It may not always be obvious, but their prophetic role and message were not always well received. This was no doubt difficult for them. They were simply speaking the message that the Lord had given them, and they were often hated and seen as party poopers. In addition, as God's messengers, they were often asked to engage in abnormal behavior to make a point to the nation. In other words, God made their lives an object lesson, and this usually meant hardship for the prophet. There was a cost. Although much debate surrounds the exact character of the woman in Hosea chapter 1, verse 2, most would agree that Hosea is asked to marry an adulterous woman. If you step back and think about this calling from the Lord, it does not take long to feel the great difficulty of God's calling on his life. It is an object lesson that lasted throughout Hosea's life. It was marriage, and it was permanent. And again, although there is discussion about what is exactly meant by God's call to Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 20, verses 2 through 4, he is asked to walk about stripped of his clothes and barefoot. I think that this is one of those object lessons that we might not want to take a step back and ponder it. As we say, too much information. Yet God is the one who calls him to do it. Whatever it is that God calls a person to is less about the person and more about God. The person God calls is simply to yield and hold on to the fact that God knows what he is doing. So what help did Israel have in determining whether or not a prophet might be a true prophet or a false prophet? For starters, there were certain qualifications which needed to be true of a prophet. These qualifications were provided in the Mosaic Law. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 22, provides important teaching on determining the calling of a true prophet. Their prophetic message was to be the contrast to the divination and witchcraft practiced by pagan nations during that time period. Their prophetic message was received from the Lord, not from magical incantations or the like. If a person claimed to be a prophet and exercised divination or witchcraft, then that person was not a prophet of the Lord. No questions asked. 
Anyone in the nation of Israel should have turned and run in the opposite direction if they were ever faced with this situation. We also learn that a true prophet was to be a mediator, one who bridged the relationship between God and humanity. According to Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 through 21, the model was that God would speak a message to the prophet, and then the prophet would speak that same message to the nation. God to the prophet to the nation. The prophet was the mediator or the bridge between the two entities. The relationship of Moses, Aaron, and Pharaoh provides an interesting picture of the role of prophets. In Exodus 7, 1 and 2, the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh. So God speaks to the prophet, and the message is delivered. God to the prophet to Pharaoh. Again, the prophet was the mediator or the bridge between the other two entities. Because the prophet was speaking a message from God, the prophet was to be obeyed and feared. This was not for any special quality within the prophet. It was simply because they were delivering a message from the Lord. As we learned earlier, Israel was warned that false prophets would also be active in their midst, creating some struggle about who to believe. The difficulty for the people was that false prophecy could contain elements of truth, which made the prophecy believable. You may have heard the saying, in every heresy there is an element of truth. That is what makes it believable. Well, that is true, and it creates difficulty for the hearer. Or the difficulty could be a result that the message was simply the kind of message that the people wanted to hear. Every leader has a desire to be liked, so why not tell people a palatable message, something they want to hear? So a false prophet was one who spoke presumptuously, meaning God had not spoken to them. As in 1 Kings 22, or they might speak in the name of another God, as in 1 Kings 18. In either case, Israel was not to listen. True prophetic messages were from the Lord because they were the result of the Lord speaking to the prophet. So what was an Israelite to do in an environment where a prophet would claim divine authority but was not a true prophet of the Lord? It was important that the people made certain that a prophet conformed to the tests of true prophecy. The prophet must prophesy that which comes true, speak in the name of the Lord, and never call for rebellion against the Lord as found in Deuteronomy 13. How was one to determine whether or not a prophecy came true, at least without waiting to see? It seems that it was important for a prophet to gain a reputation by having a good history of passing the tests of prophecy. In other words, they gained a reputation as a true prophet. Or in the case of someone like Elisha, there was a clear transfer of prophetic role. Elisha was confirmed in his role when he used Elijah's mantle to part the waters of the Jordan River in the presence of the company of prophets in the same way that Elijah had previously done and in the presence of the same company of prophets. When this happened, the company of the prophets knew that Elisha was to be feared as the prophet of the Lord. Israel had some additional responsibility in accepting or rejecting prophetic utterance. According to the same passage, they were to test the message with what they knew from the teaching they had already received from God's spokespersons, like the law of Moses. If a prophet were speaking in the name of the Lord, then their message would be consistent with the already revealed message from the Lord. As we said earlier, this is similar to what we do today. We listen to the voice of God's messengers to us with our Bibles open. Any messenger of God will speak a message that is consistent with God's already revealed word. The entirety of the law from the Mosaic Covenant, which served as Israel's Bible, was the firm foundation on which the nation was to stand. Every message was to be evaluated from the foundational teaching of this law. 
they must always be asking, did the message from such and such a prophet conform to God's already revealed message? One test which Israel was to use was an easy one. As mentioned above, Deuteronomy chapter 13 verses 1 through 5 states a principle very clearly. If a prophet were to ever proclaim that Israel should go after another god, then that prophecy should not only be shunned, that prophet should be put to death. There was not to be any tolerance for a prophet who sought to lead the nation away from the Lord. This kind of evil was to be purged from Israel's midst immediately. Finally, the people of Israel were to verify the signs of the prophet. When the Lord called Moses to go to the nation of Israel to deliver them out of their Egyptian slavery, Moses curiously asked, what if they will not believe me? So the Lord gave him three signs to give to the people to verify that he was a prophet. He could throw down his staff and it would turn into a snake. Then he could pick it up by the tail and it would turn back into his staff. Or he could put his hand in his cloak and pull it out and it would be leprous. Then he could put his hand back into his cloak and pull it out and it would be healed. Or he could take water from the Nile River, pour it onto the ground and it would become blood. For Israel to require such proof was not a negative thing. God gave prophets the ability to produce these signs in order to verify their prophetic message. The signs meant that the prophet was sent by the Lord and that his words were the words of the Lord. The prophet was also to confirm to criteria as set forth by other passages. According to Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, he was to be an Israelite and clearly called by the Lord. His only authority was speaking in the name of the Lord, as if the Lord himself was speaking. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 17, the prophetic role, including the message, was to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. How they received their message, we do not always know, but we do know that their message was Holy Spirit empowered. And finally, the prophet was to be a good shepherd who genuinely cared for the Lord's people, not an evil shepherd who was self-seeking. Both of these types of shepherds are described in Ezekiel chapter 34. True prophets obediently brought a message from the Lord because that is what the people needed to hear. And they delivered this message regardless of the personal cost. The main point is that a good shepherd sought the good of the Lord's people, and that is what a prophet was to do. And they did, even if it meant walking around naked and barefoot. The prophetic message is not about the prophet. The prophet is bringing a message from the Lord to the people. This message could be directed to Judah, Israel, or even other nations. Some prophetic messages could be addressed to all three. Whenever God had a message that needed to be delivered to a people who needed to hear it, he simply sent a prophet to those people with his message. Therefore, the message would often address specific sins of the people. It was a message to them, serving as a corrective to their behavior. The particular time period of the prophetic message could also be different. Prophets play a major role in Israel from the time of Samuel through the kingdom period and until the end of the Old Testament. So these messages could have occurred before the fall of Israel, before the fall of Judah, during the time period of the exile, or even after the exile when the people returned to the land. In fact, each of the prophets whose messages are preserved in a book fit somewhere in the biblical context from the middle of 1 Kings through 2 Kings through the exile and until the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Although all prophetic books apply throughout time to God's people, some prophetic messages are more timeless in nature because we have no idea where they might fit within the history of Israel. The content of the message also differed. The content was focused on whatever the needs of the people might be. So we find messages that are focused on the indictment of sin, which could be sin against God or sin against his people, judgment for sin, 
and hope for God's continuing mercy, including promises of the restoration of the nation. In each prophecy, there are a possibility of five components to the message, including number one, a statement of God's legal suit against his people. Number two, an announcement of judgment. Number three, a call for repentance. Number four, a proclamation of the good news of God's mercy in spite of Israel's disobedience. And number five, an affirmation of God's faithfulness to his covenant commitment to fulfill his promises and eventually to usher in his eternal kingdom. As has already been related, the Mosaic Covenant is usually central to the message of the prophets. So the problem in each message to God's people is that the nation has moved away from the Lord and the stipulations outlined in the Mosaic Covenant. As a result, the Lord responds to this rebellion by sending messengers, known as prophets, to remind the nation of this covenant. They are spokespersons for God, and they make his will known in a contemporary situation. They deliver messages from the theocratic king in a formal manner, as through a pronouncement, or an informal manner when someone comes to them seeking a word from the Lord. Since the messages are most concerned with the situation of the nation, the prophets are often directing their messages to the leadership and often contain many political overtones. And since the main concern is the breaking of the covenant, the prophets usually issue a call to repentance, calling the people to return to their God. The messages are delivered over a long time period in diverse historical situations, but they are delivered by one God who is delivering one message concerning one covenant, which he has with his people. According to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses one through five, these messages were based squarely upon the word that God had previously given. God's message is consistent. He gives the same message over and over. So the focus of prophetic message is not to satisfy curiosity about the future, but rather a call to return to the message that God has already given. The messages are brought into a contemporary situation, addressing the key issues which confront the nation. With every message, God is moving toward his people with the goal of deepening their relationship. A modern-day example of a prophetic word would be the role of the sermon on Sunday morning. If you attend a good church, the preacher does not stand before his congregation and offer his musings or even a new and different message week after week, no. The preacher opens up God's already revealed word and delivers that same God-given message to a contemporary audience addressing the key issues which confront them in their situation. It is a message from the Lord delivered to his people, people who need to hear it, and more importantly, to live it. When we open our Bibles to these prophetic books, we must note that they are primarily collections of separately preached messages or sermons. Often, we do not even have an exact context, nor do we have an exact order of how the messages were delivered. They have now been combined into individual books with a clear theological focus, even though they might feel a little detached from their actual context. The messages are also very poetic, and as a result, they can be difficult to read. Poetry uses many devices that easily blur the message, especially when we are not completely aware of certain images or poetic emphases. Because of the centrality of the Mosaic Law to the prophetic message, worship observances, the love of God, social issues, the love of neighbor are very important. The nation's love for God was best verified in their singular worship of his greatness as well as a mutual love for one another. So the issue of idolatry and false worship, which is a lack of love for the Lord, and the mistreatment and oppression of one's neighbor, which is a lack of love for neighbor, were primary concerns in each prophetic message. 
The main thrust of the prophetic message is always the work of God in this world to call people to turn to him in absolute worship and obedience. The nation needed this message because they had foolishly walked away from the stipulations of the Mosaic Covenant, turning from the Lord. As a result of the nation's turning away, God's first judgment is the division of the kingdom into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. It is during this time that the prophetic office grows in prominence. These two kingdoms habitually turn away from the Lord, and the Lord habitually calls them back. The northern kingdom of Israel was composed of 10 tribes, with the capital being Samaria, and before annihilation, there were 19 kings, and all were bad. The southern kingdom of Judah was composed of two tribes with the capital being Jerusalem, and before exile, there were 20 kings. Only eight were good. But the Lord moves toward them, and his prophets prophesied to one nation or the other, delivering a specific message with the goal of calling the Lord's people back to covenant fidelity. You need to know that these messages matter to your life as well. There was a dual purpose for the prophetic messages. As the prophet delivered his message, it was a message in their time, meaning it was a message to be understood within its historic, geographic, and cultural contexts. The people needed to respond. But the message was also out of their time, meaning it was a message which was to be understood in relation to the overall purposes of God in this world to redeem a people for himself. So, these messages concern the establishment of God's eternal kingdom, the judgment of the wicked, and the vindication of the godly remnant. As the prophet addressed the nation, God was also revealing the bigger picture of his plans for all of humanity, including you and me. So we need to respond as well. The reason why we will be turning to these prophetic books is so that we can grow in our relationship with the Lord. Despite the prevailing understanding of prophecy, these messages were not delivered to satisfy one's curiosity about the future. They meant to have a practical effect upon one's lifestyle and to bring a greater awareness of holiness through repentance, much like a Sunday morning sermon. So generally, they were not time-specific, but instead they had an imminent sense to them. The focus of written prophecy is complicated because one can perceive four different situations. Number one, the immediate contemporary situation of the people. Number two, the immediate future of the people, including a focus on future captivity or restoration. Number three, the references to Christ and his kingdom begin to increase in prophetic literature. And number four, an ultimate focus on the future new heavens and new earth, which will one day be ushered in. Knowing which situation the prophet has in mind is the difficulty of prophetic interpretation. Two simplistic approaches to prophetic literature which are to be avoided. Number one, an approach which stresses the predictive element. And number two, an approach which stresses the contemporary situation. We must realize that prophecy concerns both of these elements. The prophetic message is concerned with the contemporary situation, and it is concerned with the future. God is moving everything in a direction, and the prophets are brought in on his purposes. So the messages to the prophets show how the contemporary situation fits into the plan of God and how he will use it to judge and refine or comfort and encourage his people. Therefore, prophecy is God's message to the present in light of his ongoing redemptive purposes and plan for humanity. As we read through the prophets, let's keep in mind that we learn a lot about God's desire for us to remain completely focused on him and his purposes. In our own context, the Lord wants us to keep our hands on the plow and not look back until the church is matured and the gospel has gone to every unreached people group. 
the prophets will constantly force us to ask how we are doing with our own covenant. Are we wholly devoted to the Lord? That is the question that will constantly be set before us. And may the Lord bless you as you work your way through this prophetic message and may he stir in your own heart a deeper devotion to him.